Grace and peace be with you all. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. It is amazing that the lectionary scriptures that were chosen nearly three years in advance, both the epistle we read today and the gospel we're about to read is so relevant to where our life is in this very moment. So let's open our ears and be attentive to the, what the Holy Spirit is saying today. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the print of the nails, and the place my finger in the mark of the nails, and place my hand in his side, I will not believe. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. The doors were shut, but Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put your hand to the place in my side. Do not be faithless, but believing. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Happy are they who hear these words, believe them, and obey them. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. His name. God with us, God with us, revealed in us, His name is called Emmanuel. Speak to us this day, O Lord. Not from the outer court or the inner court, but from the very, or the outer court or the inner court, but the holy of holies. Feed us not only the milk of thy word, the bread of thy word, but the meat of that word, that we may grow strong and be mature sons and daughters of Christ, manifesting your kingdom to all creation. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. You may be seated wherever you're at. Or you may lay down on your sofa or recline in your recliner, or whatever you're doing, wherever you're at, it's all good. We're in the resurrection season. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. He is alive in his church. He's alive in his people. He's alive in his body. Today we see in John that they were shuttered in. The disciples were shuttered in. They were in quarantine out of fear. <laughs> it actually says the doors were shut and locked. It just is fascinating to me how the scriptures align with the reality of our life in some mystical way. 
And they were locked for fear, and the Jews were there. See, fear can lock you up. They were fearful because they felt hopeless. Hopelessness gives birth to fear, which causes us to lock the doors of our life. They are hopeless because they cannot perceive the impossible to be possible. They'd walk with Jesus, they'd heard Jesus, now we're down to the nitty gritty. No longer is this all conceptual, no longer is this all just historical. Now they have to decide what do they believe. And they locked the doors and were in hiding out of fear. But hope and faith are the keys that unlock the shackles of fear. Because we have a, our, our, our religion is a religion of faith. And hope, hope birthed out of faith. How many times in your life have you said something like this? That could never happen, it's impossible. I'll never go through this, it's over. I'll never get over it. This is all there is or ever will be, just accept it. No way, not now, not ever. A real cynical, apathetic attitude can set in when fear has the doors locked. We all live with our own version of what is and what isn't possible. Most of the time, most of the time, we live our life based on what we consider to be possible. That's how we operate. If it's possible, we'll live our life, make decisions accordingly. We consider the range of possibilities and then we make those decisions of life, choose a direction we're going to go, Take our next step and all within the boundaries of what we perceive as possible. But to embrace Christianity, you've got to believe we have the God of the impossible. The impossibility is normal for God. It's not normal for us, but it's normal for God. But what if life is bigger than that? What if the impossible can be made real? What if the impossible really does happen? What if the impossible is really possible? The possibility of the impossible is the story of Christ. It's the story of Easter. Always stepping through our locked doors of impossibility. That's what Christ does. He steps through the doors of our shut doors of impossibility. That's the good news of our faith. Richard Kearney and Jen Zimmerman, who wrote Regaining the Sacred, says this, the unexplainable and the impossible are not the same thing. Because something is unexplainable does not mean it's not possible. That's the paradox. The impossible becomes possible without being understandable. And when it, <laughs> and when it does, the doors are flung open. And a whole new field of perception, and this is about perception, this is about how I look at things, and possibilities lie before us. Turn to somebody near you and say, it's time to swing the doors that are locked out of fear open. And that I need a perception of great possibility. John 20, 19, 31 says, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. In other words, blessed are those who don't need to understand or have evidence. Blessed are those who can see with different eyes than logical, rational eyes. They can see with the eyes of their heart. Hope is the main impulse of life, Elia Diello says. She's a Franciscan theologian. Hope deferred, Proverbs says, makes the heart sick. When we become hopeless, our heart becomes sick. But we become hopeless when we allow fear to lock the doors to our life. But when desire is fulfilled, it is a tree of life. So hope is a big deal. It is the main impulse of life. When a person loses hope, they become depressed. They become apathetic. When a person loses hope about their present life or their future life, they shut down because the doors are shut. But I'm here to say to you, Jesus is ready to walk through that shut door and declare to you, peace be with you. (laughs) Romans 8, 24 says... For in this hope we were saved by faith. In this hope, 
There are different kinds of hope. There's common hope and then there's sacramental hope. There's common hope and there's mystical hope. There's common hope and there's mysterious hope. We are saved in a mysterious hope, not a common hope. But hope, the the Bible says, but hope, the object of which is seen is not hope. Hope you can see is not hope. If you can see it, it's not hope, according to what Romans 8 says. For who hopes for what he already sees? Sometimes we think analysis is hope. Figuring it out is hope. But figuring it out, Father, is not hope. Hope that is seen is not really true hope. It's a, it's a downplayed version of hope. Listen to what the Bible says. But if we hope for what we do not see, if we hope for what we cannot see, we wait eagerly for it with patience and composure. Turn to somebody next to you and say, stay composed. Stay composed during this time of suffering and trial for the testing of your faith. I'm here to tell you, we may be shuttered in a room, but we're not shuttered in. We may be distanced, but we're not disconnected. That there is a hope that transcends shut and locked and shuttered down buildings. Second Corinthians 5.7 says, therefore, being always of good courage, always of good courage, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. And sight sometimes is not just optical visual sight, it's intellectual sight. Sometimes we have to see beyond what Natural things tell us, because natural things are just limited manifestations of true reality. Oh boy. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be present and at home with the Lord. Before my sermon's over today, we're going to challenge some of the issues in your life where there's hopelessness. We are so quickly led to despair in this culture, because we are so soft We are so in need of comfort. We are in such need of, you know, convenience that we are led to despair easily. Most of us cannot endure suffering for long without some sliver of hope, some sliver of meaning, some evidence or proof to support our need for answers. And we've said this over and over. Life is not so much about answers. It's a life of unanswered questions. So... We look at suffering and hope in perfect harmony. And same way death and resurrection, light and darkness, hope and suffering in perfect harmony gives us faith. Most of us want hope without suffering. We want suffering without hope. So we have what we call the die version. Die, the opposite of die is re. (laughs) Die version, re version. So I was looking at some of the dies in your life, like disappointment. Either disappointment in ourselves, disappointment in others, disappointment in our leaders. Disappointment can cause suffering. And the, but the Bible says in Romans 5, not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance, proven character. And proven character, hope. Hope is birthed out of a character that endures. And hope does not disappoint. So if you have disappointment, hope will remove that that disappointment and create appointment. Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So we have to turn our die into a re, our disappointment into a reappointment. I like what Father Anthony Watson t- uh, tweeted yesterday. He said, appointment, a disappointment is an appointment with, hum- uh, with humility. <laughs> That's a powerful thing because God gives more grace to the humble. Is a powerful word. How about disillusionment? Disillusionment, some of you are suffering from disillusionment right now. When our expectations are not being met our, and there's unkept promises in our life. Whoever is pregnant with evil, Proverbs says, or the Psalms say, whoever is pregnant with evil conceives trouble and gives birth to disillusionment. Evil gives birth to disillusionment, not grace. Dissatisfaction. 
unsatisfied because of emotional and natural and carnal cravings. I'm not able to have what I crave creates this dissatisfaction with life. Disagreements. Some of you are suffering from being in a, in a disagreement battle caused by ego, caused by pride, and caused by your own preferences. Oh, hallelujah. Distraction. Some of you are suffering because you're so distracted by everything going on. All the talking heads on TV, all of the predictions, all the, all the models that are being put out there, and none of the models add up, and they're doing stuff in Taiwan, they're doing stuff in Sweden. They're do- hey, some of us are just distracted with too much unreliable information. Issues competing for my attention, taking me away from being devoted from the God, from the God that I serve. First Corinthians says, this I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint on you, but to promote what is appropriate to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. My prayer today is that we not be distracted from our devotion to God. Division, division, separation and stubbornness through fears. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be made complete in the same mind and the same judgment. Our die vision needs to become revision. We have to move from die to re. Dissension, obsession with negativity. That's what a dissensive spirit is. It's someone obsessed with the negative, possible worst case scenario outcomes. That is focused on the impossibilities rather than the possibilities. Debt, fear of lack. Is that what you're suffering from? Is the fear of lack? The fear of resources, not trusting in daily bread? Because that's all God, we ask God for is our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. If I have my daily bread. So we need to turn that into a resource. Our daily bread is our resource. Divorce. They say that through this pandemic, the divorce application for divorce has gone up over 35 to 40%. Irreconcilable differences. When you reach a point where you say we're irreconcilable, you have moved into a place of hopelessness. Whether it's a marriage, a relationship, a parent, child, parent, sibling, there is nothing that's irreconcilable. All things are reconcilable. So divorce, divorce must become a reconciling attitude through hope. Disease, which we are facing now, which is dis-ease. <laughs> disease can cause disease. It's unexpected, unexplainable sickness on the body, mind, or spirit. But by his stripes we were healed. Not by his stripes we're going to be healed. And so disease must become our recover. We recover from disease. Distancing. Oh, this is what we're talking about now. Our culture is all about distancing. And let me say this. Loss of intimate support connection with others has a greater impact on all of us than we earlier thought it would cause. We are beginning to realize even though we're doing the right thing, this disconnection is almost unbearable. Though we're absent from the body, we are always ever present with one another in the Lord. So our distancing is a reconnect in hope. We will reconnect and we will not become a faceless, touchless society because we see by touching That's why Thomas had to touch the sea. He didn't have to hear the sea. He had to touch the sea. He said, touch me here. If we take touch away from ourselves out of fear, then we're going to be locked up in hopelessness. In the meantime, we need to be wise. In the meantime, we need to walk in the faith God has given us. And then death, ultimately. The loss of someone or something I depended on. The loss of something or someone I loved. The loss of something or someone that makes me feel secure and valued. 
But my question today is, oh, death, where is your sting? If we're going to believe that Christ is risen, we got to believe there's no sting in death. There's just a transition in death. We go from death to resurrection, and there is no resurrection without a death. If you're suffering in any one of these things, I'm here to declare to you that there is revision for division. There is resource for death. There is reconciliation for divorce. There is recovery from disease, and there is reconnection from dis- distancing. And there is resurrection from death. Christ is risen. So where and in what does your hope lie? Where and in what does your hope lie today? Does it lie in ordinary hope? What we call common hope. Tied to outcomes and optimistic feelings. Expectations and signs of improvement in our circumstances. That's ordinary hope. Or is your, are you tied to ordinary hope in the sense that all things you'll just get better in the future? I'm here to reveal to you the hope our faith calls for, which is mystical hope or sacramental hope. A complete reversal of our usual way at looking things. It's a counterpoint. It weaves its way past this upbeat magical hope where you pull rabbits out of hats. Faith is quiet, even ironic uh, counterpoint to the impossible that we face. This type of faith, this mystical hope, stares in the face of apparent negativity, circumstances, and situations beyond closed doors. Beloved, I'm here to tell you today, the road that is built in hope is more pleasant to the traveler than the road that is built in despair. Even though they both lead to the same destination, the road of hope is more pleasant. So let's look at some observations about this hope or this faith that the apostle was talking about. Mystical sacramental hope is not tied to a good outcome or to the future. It lives a life of its own inside of us. In the now, without reference to external circumstances, and or conditions. It has something to do with presence. It has to do with the presence of God. Not a future good outcome, but the immediate experience of being met, held in communion with God, intimately right at hand now, for now faith is. It bears fruit within, at the psychological level, in the sensations of strength and joy and satisfaction, an unbearable lightness of being. Mysteriously, rather than deriving these gifts from outward expectations, our needs are met in the very seat of our soul with the presence of God. Listen, beloved, as I conclude, mystical hope is not intended to be an extraordinary infusion but an abiding state of being. It's a state of being no matter what the external world says. We lose sight of the invitation, our responsibility as stewards of creation when we move out of mystical hope into common hope. We ourselves are not the source of our own hope. We do not manufacture it. But the source that dwells dwells deeply within us and flows to us with abundance. The good news is that this deeper current does does exist and you and I actually can find it. My prayer for you today is that you'll find this mystical hope in your life in the midst of all that we're facing or that you're facing. The journey to internally birthed hope is not something that will change your life in the externals. Rather, it is something that will change your innermost way of perceiving the impossible. From there, your perception will inevitably rearrange the external world that you look at. Now faith is in the now faith. Let's say that together. Now faith is in the now faith. Beloved, 
The journey to mystical hope is really a journey toward the center of our innermost ground of being where we commune with God. In conclusion, Hebrews 11, 1, 2 in the Amplified Bible says this, Now faith is the assurance, the title, the deed, and the confirmation of things hoped for, divinely guaranteed, and the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of their reality. Faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by physical senses. Listen to that. Faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by physical senses. For by this kind of faith, the men of old gain divine approval. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. What are your doors of impossibility today? Where are you suffering? What possibilities have you locked out of your life because of fear? The keys of hope and faith are ready to unlock those shackles today. So what if instead of starting with what we consider possible, reasonable, realizable, we begin with the impossible? Let us not get trapped by what we think is possible. Let's go to the place of impossibility in our life. That is where Christ is showing up behind locked doors. This is where he is breathing peace on us. This is where the doors are being opened. This is where new life is beginning. This is where we all want to be. Behind those closed and shuttered doors, the Lord appears within to say, peace be with you. I give you peace. I leave you peace. Not as the external world can give you, but only my Father in heaven can give you. Bow your head and pray with me. Oh, great God of creation and love, thank you for living and loving in us and through us. May all that we do flow from our deep connection with you and all beings. Help us become a community that vulnerably, vulnerably shares each other's burdens as well as the weight of glory. Listen to our hearts, longings for the healing of our city, our nation, and our world. Lord, we embrace the wellspring of your Holy Spirit welling up within us, your presence deep within us, and await that mystical hope we so desperately long for and need at this time of testing and trial in our lives. Amen, amen, amen. One of my dear brothers who's a priest in Texas, who's a farmer, he says, we need agricultural faith. Agricultural faith says this, when they tell you we're going to have a drought this year, you don't have faith for rain. You have faith that you're going to make it whether it rains or not. I'm here to tell you that's a new kind of hope that whether it rains or not we're going to make it and I'm here to declare to you today we are going to make it beyond closed doors let us stand and profess our faith in almighty God we believe in one God 